Moving on, uh, our third session uh, is going to be uh, taken by Professor Utpal Tatu. Uh, so we welcome uh, you, Professor, uh, and he. Um, so he is a molecular biologist, uh, a biochemist, and a professor at the Department of Biochemistry of the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, and uh, we're very grateful uh, that uh, you're going to be teaching us about the global access uh, to vaccines. And we're looking forward to, um, you know, our fears regarding the vaccine being addressed by you. Thank you. Sir, you are on mute. Could you please unmute yourself? Okay, good. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, very happy to be here today talking to um, the students. Uh, um, I think a large number of uh, school students, I understand, and very, very, very happy to share some of my uh, experiences and ideas about, uh, about the topic that uh, we are uh, deliberating today. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to actually be, be at this forum. First time for me, but I think uh, it sounds very exciting. I also heard the talk earlier earlier this morning and uh, very nice to see the question answer sessions and uh, interactions that students are having with, uh, with the speakers. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, briefly, but uh, what I'll do is, you know, I was given the topic of talking uh, about vaccines. Uh, uh, about uh, you know global vaccine availability and so on, and which is what I will I will definitely cover that part in my uh, discussion in my talk uh, this uh, in the next few minutes. But I thought what might be also exciting is to share with the students um, what can a scientist do? Uh, how exciting is it to be a scientist? And uh, what are scientists' responsibilities towards society? Uh, and through my personal experiences, I'll narrate uh, what uh, I have done, a little bit about what I've done, and and also about how one one how what an exciting opportunity it is uh, to be doing science, uh, to to also be a science student. You really don't need to be actually a scientist, but even if you are a science student, how exciting it is actually, and then uh, how important it is to be able to think what can you do when the world is facing a challenge of the kind that we are witnessing today, the pandemic. Uh, every, every science student has an opportunity to do something. You really don't need to be a scientist. And then what are the possible things that you can do uh, through your ideas, through communication, through... And at the end, and of course, how does it... Um, what kind of opportunities does it provide for students to uh, interact with the society? During this time, this is what uh, my my hope is that I'll convey in the thirty minutes or so that I have. But I will um, uh, share with you some of the some of the things that I have done, and then and and uh, what are uh, other scientists also trying to do um, while we talk about the while we talk about the vaccines as well. So yes, I'm going to put the vaccine story in the context of the title that I put forward for you here role of a scientist uh, during the pandemic and then COVID-19 research, diagnosis and vaccine. Touch upon all of these aspects uh, for, for the students and, and I will try to make it more interactive and uh, you know in a way that we, uh, I hope I, I can convey to the students the excitements of science and, and, and possibly also trigger uh, some of the students to take up science as a, as a as a as a subject to study further and then and then uh, take for take it forward as a as a career. So uh, let me start with this very simple idea. You know, um, today of course the pandemic is 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 staring at us and we continue to uh, engage with it, understand how to deal with it, and so on. Uh, my own interactions um, as a scientist have been in the area of neglected infectious diseases. So this is the term that I want to spend a few couple of slides talking about neglected infectious diseases, and I also want to take back uh, take back this discussion to the time when I decided to do science and what I how I decided to do the topics that I research on, and again my my intention is that um, some of some of the students may get 
make it interested uh, in, in pursuing science uh, after the school, college, or whatever they are doing at the moment. So neglected infectious diseases are the kinds of infections that, that are not heavily researched upon. Uh, and COVID-19, in some ways, is an example of that. There are large numbers in, in, in all over the world where uh, infectious diseases uh, take a toll on various economies, uh, various, uh, various populations all over the world. But among them, there are diseases which are predominantly present in underdeveloped and developing nations. And, and those are the diseases which do not often get enough attention for the reason that uh, there is no financial benefit in, in um, doing, in, in, for example, developing diagnostics, developing drugs against such diseases because they are in a poor income category of uh, nations where uh, drugs and diagnostic kits and vaccines will have to be at a very affordable price. And so pharma companies often don't see that as a as a uh, encouragement. Uh, that's not where their money will be returned or their investment can find return. Uh, and justifiably so, of course, pharma companies have to think about their uh, business and you know, their sustenance. So it's understandable. But that's really why many diseases remain neglected they do not they're not enough there's not enough research happening on it and there's not um, products coming out to manage these diseases and the list of these diseases is large of course but what i've shown you on this colorful slide is some of the infectious organisms uh, such as amebiasis giardiasis trichomonosis plasmodium it's no longer neglected but it was on the list of neglected at some point in time and then many other infections. And these are the infections that uh, my laboratory at Indian Institute of Science tries to research on and tries to uh, understand can, what can we do, uh, understand uh, not only in the lab, but also in the field. So that's really what neglected infectious diseases are. And when I started my research career after finishing my studies and postdoctoral studies, my motivation was really uh, to look around in the society. What are the current problems that, as a scientist, as a biologist, as a, um, as a, uh, um, you know, I could I could um, uh, make a difference with, and that's really how I decided that diseases which I saw around me at that time, uh, which was malaria and trypanosomiasis and diarrhea, I decided that can I do something on it? I really didn't have much background in studying these infections earlier, but I decided that this is how I will interact with the society. So that's really how my journey began in, this, began in this field. So what I'm going to do in my talk in the next few minutes is to first start giving you an ex a broader perspective about neglected diseases, its connection with our environment, our animals, and us, ourselves, our activities. That's a broader topic which results in pandemics of the kind that we are witnessing today. I already talked to you about neglected diseases. I'll dwell upon it a little bit more and then jump into the main topic of uh, my own experiences in COVID-19 uh, and then eventually a um, little bit broader discussions on vaccines and the way forward uh, with uh, where we are heading. Um, uh, pandemic is not over. Everybody's still worried about what, what might happen next. So this is the part that connects with what I told you earlier, that neglected infectious diseases. And then the idea that I'm going to, that I'm trying to convey through the slide that I've shown you here is that majority of diseases that we hear about today, in fact, are contracted by humans through its environment. And large number of them, in fact, as many as 70% of our infections actually come from animals. And this is an important matter, important point that I want to get across to you that you know we interact with our animals very closely and our interactions with our animals uh, is changing rapidly uh, be it uh, agricultural animals cattle sheep buffaloes be it uh, recreational animals uh, be it pets all of these uh, have an impact on and and while we think about humans should remain healthy but we often forget that the health of humans actually depends on what is around us it's equally important to keep our animals healthy in order for us to be healthy. This is what I've been preaching and practicing for the last 20, more than 20 years that I've been here um, and doing my research. And then, of course, last two years have been what an eye opener it has been. Uh, I think many of the things that uh, we uh, talk about has unfortunately come true that 
so because of the neglect of dealing with animals in taking care of and uh, examining animals uh, infections have jumped across jump species boundaries have come from animals to humans and i want to show you here that large number of diseases and the lists are here i'm not sure if you'll be able to read it but rabies is an example that all of us are aware, are aware of and many other viral and non-viral parasitic infections coming from small rodents to birds to deers to pigs we know about swine influenza from cattle and then of course uh, poultry all of this of course and then of course there is the environment in, which includes uh, the flora and fauna which all are potentially source of transmission of diseases for all of us and that's something that i'm I've, i'm want to come uh, get across my own research has predominantly focused on such infections infections that jump from animals into humans and the list of which i showed you early on these infections early on of course are within animals but then they transmit into humans and then they can be transmitted from humans back to animals and then among animals and as a result they become uh, uh, they stabilize in the in the environment and very hard to then deal with as i talk about this idea i want to put forward this simple table if i ask if this were to be an offline seminar i would ask my students that tell me what are the most common infections that you heard of and the answers would be influenza people would talk about ebola because they talk about it in uh, newspapers and would talk about of course uh, uh, things like zika virus and nipah all of these are there in the table that i'm showing you here ebola zika nipah swine severe uh, uh, acute respiratory syndrome middle east respiratory syndrome avian influenza and then most interestingly importantly and recent one the wuhan coronavirus outbreak the common thing that ties all of this is that all of them, as I was telling you earlier, have jumped from animals and uh, other mammals into humans, uh, and sometimes from birds, as in case of avian influenza. I will not go deep into the science of it, but all of these infections, be it most of them from uh, viruses, actually uh, have caused havoc. In many of them, there were outbreaks, major outbreaks, a lot of fatalities happened. Many of them were controlled. And then we are still dealing with the last one, which is Wuhan outbreak, which originated in China. And this particular part of the table talks about where this infections originated. So yes, indeed, what I'm telling you is a reality. Infections are spreading across uh, very efficiently all over the world. Uh, so what I'll tell you that as a scientist, then what have I been able to do about it? You know, as scientists, oftentimes we, we do research in our laboratories um, and that's what I do. And we do fundamental discoveries by observing organisms, by looking, studying them in the laboratory, observing them under the microscope and applying whatever scientific tools there are uh, to uh, understand how these organisms work, how these infections spread. And then one publishes uh, uh, academic papers uh, to uh, to share with the academic community when collaborations can happen, exchange of ideas can happen. And that's really what life of a scientist is all, all about. It, it's all about being, being able to make observations um, that excite you and then share it with the scientific community. That's really what one does as a fundamental scientist, which is what I started my career as. Over the years, then I realized that many of the diseases that I'm dealing with actually cause great damage in the society. And so I decided that, yes, I have to turn my attention away from the laboratory, also look at the surroundings and clinical samples, uh, diseases as they happen in the field. And which is what I got busy doing in the last 10 to 15 years, applying or extrapolating observations from the basic science, uh, laboratory-based research into the clinical. And eventually then, one hopes that many of these observations will result in some interventions, be it at the diagnostic, tool level or drug level. And this is something that I'm embarking on. And in some small, minute way, I'm, uh, I, we had some success. And again, uh, I must say that this is not to glorify my uh, small, uh, small success stories, but really to make an example out of it for students who may find it exciting that, hey, this is the career I want to take off. This is what I want to do with my uh, education in the years to come. So, what I did uh, early on is to be able to connect the laboratory science 
to the science as is applied in the field to the problems that are faced by people by 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 um, the farmers by animal owners and and also by community at large i created a platform and my institute indian institute of science was very very supportive and helping us create a platform where we could actually uh, convey our science to the society we could actually create products we could actually provide service uh, at a very different level levels they in fact gave me access to a laboratory a laboratory where all of this interaction can happen uh, in a in a way that there would be no there would be no uh, limitation in terms of con con communicating and and taking science out of the laboratory and that's what resulted in a possibility where observations made in the laboratory could then be converted into interventions for society at large i'm going to jump into covid-19 because that's what many of you are both waiting to hear but before i do that i want to make a simple example since i gave you uh, example of a neglected infectious disease and how uh, animals are transmitting diseases and how uh, our health actually depend on the environment one of the most common example i want to raise many of you have heard about rabies while today we are in the in the in the midst of coronavirus pandemic but we must keep our eyes open and understand that there are many other infections which have caused uh, damage to us and they continue to cause damage to us and rabies being an example again a zoonotic infection transmitted from animals to humans we do not have effective way of diagnosing such infectious diseases even today and india is an is is actually an important place where significant number of rabies cases are reported one of the more highest numbers world over uh, of rabies and rabies is is considered to be 100% fatal that means any human which contracts rabies is sure to um, die unfortunately and as a result an important disease so just a perspective that we are dealing with pandemic like covid today but there are host of other infections that we still do not know how to deal with and could become bigger threats in years to come and this is something that we started working on and develop very effective method of diagnosing this infection infections like rabies as well, of course spread through animal bite such as dog bite to human and then the virus enters into the bloodstream finds its way through the exon to the neurons to the cerebral uh, to the to the brain and that's how it causes neurological diseases and eventually the human dies but there is no definitive way actually to diagnose disease diagnose this infection at an early stage even though the person who contracts this disease will die it's important to isolate this person especially the animal away after identifying that it's infected in order that the spread of the infection can be spread can be prevented and that's really why diagnosis is very important and that's really what we did we developed a method to for early detection of rabies even when there are very early signs we don't yet fully know that the symptoms are there but we can actually detect the disease and that's really what was what was lacking but what i want to show at a broader level is that like rabies there are many other infections transmitted by all kinds of animals and in india there have been outbreaks at various points in various parts of the country at uh, uh, in in this uh, in this context many of us are animal lovers uh, and that's why it's very important for us to understand that, that when you take care of our animals this is an important part to make sure that they do not get infected and then further on they do not transmit the infection to animals covid-19 is glaring example of an infection that was spread from the wet market in wuhan where the animal it's an animal market where people sell animals of variety of kinds including in this case of course bats uh, bats uh, typically is not a food for humans, but some people uh, can actually they like to eat bats, and and uh, as a result, this is how the early transmission may have happened. We don't know exactly what, but I think there are a variety of uh, stories. But that's really the context in in which I'm uh, putting this emphasis on uh, taking care of animals and understanding uh, zoonotic infections. That is, an infections that are spread from animals to humans. In the next few minutes, I want to tell you again how important it is to think about it in a broader perspective. I was myself doing a lot of work on coronavirus infections in animals for the last several years. So to tell you that while we know that this infection is probably spread from bats to humans, in fact, 
very commonly in, in dogs, cats, and many other animals. And for the last several years, my laboratory was actually doing diagnosis of coronavirus infections, even before the world had heard of COVID-19. Even before the pandemic struck us, coronavirus infections continued. And then there were diagnostics that were already available for animals. And we were getting routine samples from dogs and cats for uh, diagnosis of coronavirus. As a result, already in the last few years, we had very robust methods available for diagnosis of coronavirus infections in animals. I want to tell you, some of you already know this and previous uh, speakers would have talked about it, that coronavirus derives its name from crown-like appearance because of spike glycoproteins on the surface. This is how the virus looks, be it uh, COVID-19, which has infected humans, or COVID-19 COVID or coronavirus uh, infection that happens in feline, that is in cats or in dogs. They look the same, they are the same almost the same at genetic level they are very closely related so what i would like to emphasize is that because the, the awareness that we have that animals can transmit infections we actually were at the right place at the right time in developing effective strategies for mitigating coronavirus infections and as you all know coronavirus uh, covid-19 diagnosis depended a lot on rt pcr methods which is what of course we were doing even before covid-19 and that made us in uh, you know made it possible for us actually to create a test which was very effective even for covid-19 i want to show you this it's a bit of a scientific di scientific diagram for school students some of you may understand it's a kind of a phylogenetic tree which tells you the relatedness of different uh, forms of viruses, and that happens through genome sequences. For example, the COVID-19 that infects, a uh, COVID virus that infects humans is closely related to the bat, but also uh, not so far from those that infect horses, those that infect cows, those that infect ca ca the, kid, uh, the cats, or from porks or to the dogs. And as a result, there is a lot of exchange of information that's possible. And we, of course, were working on the domains other than humans even before COVID-19. And that helps us to actually pivot in the right time and apply technologies to develop products. Very quickly, I'm going to tell you that early on, we did some very, very interesting lab-based observations. In February, March of last year, when COVID was just hitting India, we started taking clinical samples and doing genome sequencing. And that gave rise to understanding about what kinds of sequence changes, be it genome sequence changes or amino acid substitutions that have happened in the virus that's coming to India. And we found very quickly that the virus that we found were closely related to those from Bangladesh. And then those in turn were closely related to the human, uh, uh, human I mean, to the European form of COVID-19. Well, I'll, I'm going to go a bit fast and tell you that we used this knowledge early on and created a platform where we began to discuss with international bodies. In fact, at the, in February of 2019, when it was, the story was just beginning, we had a global in, sort of a conference at, in my laboratory uh, where coincidentally, there were scientists from all over the world where any were supposed to visit who were experts in infectious diseases. And that's really how on 28th January, we set up a protocol because Wuhan cases were just being reported. And then of course, as a scientist, we set up a protocol to see how the disease would progress, not knowing what was going to happen. And then of course, interacted with the government and eventually developed robust methods to mitigate this uh, pandemic. Uh, one of the early collaborators that we had was many scientists from within the city. This is February, uh, uh, actually end of January 20, 2019, when a scientist from from uh, Nimhans is making a, giving a talk in at Indian Institute of Science along with few of us uh, who, uh, who put together a team on infectious diseases to understand what we can do in this scenario. We interacted closely with the government of Karnataka and created a strategy to how uh, to understand how this disease, how we can control the disease. I'm going to skip the slides, but to tell you that this allowed us to create a robust technology for, uh, for uh, creating a way to detect the disease at the right time. And this was important because now as we look back with, you know, we have so many different tests and RT-PCR is a common household term, everybody understands. But at that time, we had to think about how to make 
how to train people to even do RT-PCR at the scale that was required at the national level. And some of it, actually, I had a, a, a chance to contribute. And in turn, we developed a test ourselves for COVID-19. What all of this resulted was actually a decrease in the number of cases because large number of tests were being conducted all over India. ICMR did a wonderful job in creating centers for testing. And as a result, today, of course, we are at a st stage where disease is in control. Uh, at a very, very good level in India, in a very enviable manner, what our country has done is exceptional in terms of mitigating the disease. Of course, the risks are still ahead and we need to continue to monitor, but yes, we are in a good position. With this sort of a, a general understanding about what, how science uh, has helped and how, how, as a scientist, I have done my part in, in interacting with the society, I will jump into uh, some additional aspects of vaccines and the way forward. Now, students, of course, are aware of the term vaccine, but the term actually was devised by a, by a, by a medical doctor by name Edward Jenner, who talked about, you know, one of, he created the, one of the first vaccines. And, and it's, it, the term came from variole vaccine. It's actually something that's related to the smallpox of cow. And that's how the term vaccine came about. And that's often interesting for us to think because as students, we are always you know, confronted with various complicated terms and we accept these terms. But it's interesting for us to think about how has this term originated because lies behind that term is an interesting story about how the whole idea would have come up. Who was the person who thought about this term? Who was the person who conceived this idea that, that there would be a way of preventing an infection through uh, now what we call as vaccine? And that gentleman was Edward Jenner. The story that I narrated to you in the first half of my talk ties up very well with the discovery of vaccine. Edward Jenner was, of course, a medical student and then a doctor. Actually, in um, the whole idea about vaccine, vaccines generated because Edward Jenner was working in the field. He was working actually close to close to an animal farm. And he observed during, and this is of course way back in 1700, actually he was working as an apprentice, a very young doctor who was first appointed to be in the field. And he made a simple observation. And I would require uh, students who are listening to this talk to pay particular attention to what I'm saying, because the, idea is very important. It's very important to ask this question that who would have th thought of this idea first? Now that people are developing vaccines and newer and newer vaccines will get developed, but who and how was the was that idea actually originating? So really, Edward Jenner, as he was working in the field, he realized that the, there was a disease which we all know about smallpox, the new generation doesn't have to deal with it as much because it's one of the first infections to have got eliminated from the world. But smallpox was a common infection. In 1700, 1800, smallpox is, was devastating. It, it, of course, was also disfiguring because it caused pustules all over the body. But that's where the virus was present and there was no uh, solution for it. But Edward Jenner, as a doctor, went around and he made an interesting observation. And this is what is written here, that Jenna learned that in some common rural areas, dairy workers would never have the often fatal or disfiguring smallpox disease. This is really how it all began, because he was working in the field and he heard through, you know, through community gossips that this particular community or, or actually rural folks, people who work with animals, people who work with cows, somehow do not get smallpox. This is really how the whole vaccine idea came to came about. And this is very important because we can, of course, while we keep reading books and we understand the basics of science, it's also important to connect that with what's happening around us. And this is a wonderful example. So Edward Jenner related this observation to everything that he had learned and thought that why, how is it that this particular population doesn't get it? Then he realized, of course, that, that these animals that these people were working with, the cows, of course, get cowpox disease. And then he conceived this idea that possibly exposure to cowpox was happening to this uh, rural folks. And somehow then some, some mechanism was getting triggered, which prevented them to get uh, 
smallpox. This is really how the idea was conceived. So if you can sort of conjecture this particular piece of information, that how a person developed an original idea by connecting his knowledge with what was happening in the field, that really would be the biggest thing that you can actually do as a, as a science student. I will move forward and tell you then rest of his rest of it is uh, just basic information that he then of course uh, thought of taking pus from the hand of a milkmaid uh, with a cowpox disease which was uh, uh, you know and scratched it into the arm of an eight year old boy and eventually found that this boy was then of course uh, did not get smallpox which was a related disease in humans so cowpox exposure was preventing smallpox uh, case. This is really how then he that's how he developed this into a vaccine and reported that his vaccine was safe in children and adults. That's really what I would call the first clinical trial of a vaccine. But uh, I hope that you appreciate the story of how the whole idea came about. And then of course Jenna went on of course to make a full-fledged vaccine which was accepted world over and it controlled this infection uh, in, in uh, you know one of the first persons to get this vaccine was FIPS and again that's a story that's present all over all over uh, the find it on Google very easily but having said that let me just say then of course uh, this principle uh, they would uh, continue and Louis Pasteur then uh, took forward this idea and developed vaccine for the virus that I talked about rabies virus because that was Imagine it was a problem in in you know, in an ancient disease uh, from 1700 to 1800 and till today. In fact, as we are speaking, there are possibly people dying of rabies. So these are infections which have been around for centuries and centuries, and we still do not have solution to this. Yes, we are talking about COVID-19, but there are many other infections, and that's why I brought up rabies as an example. Even in today, in our own city, in Nimhans, there must be patients who have contracted rabies through a dog bite and who are possibly going to die in the days to come. And this is a virus for which the vaccine was developed already by Louis Pasteur, but of course there, is, there are some gaps that we haven't been able to meet. Lastly, in the last uh, few minutes that I have, I'm going to uh, take this idea a little bit ahead and uh, tell you a bit more about the COVID-19 vaccine. I talked to you in the last few minutes about Edward Jenner's observations, how he um, came about with the idea of vaccine, how he developed a, a vaccine for smallpox. Louis Pasteur talked about rabies uh, uh, virus. And again, there's a very interesting story behind it, which I would uh, encourage you to look at. COVID-19. There was nothing that complicated. In some ways, the conceptually co developing a COVID-19 vaccine was not an intellectual challenge. There's a little information that you'd be very surprised to hear that for animals, there was already a vaccine for coronavirus. For last decade, actually, many animals are being vaccinated for coronavirus infection. So proof of principle was already there that coronavirus infections can be controlled by vaccination in animals. So it really wasn't as if it's going to be intellectually difficult to create COVID-19. But COVID-19, of course, we had different sequences. It had different genomes, so you had to make a vaccine for it. So what was the big challenge? The challenge was not the idea of, but the challenge was implementation, as is often the case for many things, many, uh, uh, many things that were, which have to reach the society. So if you keep that in mind, then I think the next few minutes will become more interesting for you. Vaccines, of course, are of different kinds. Now you hear about COVID-19 vaccine in newspapers, RNA vaccine, DNA vaccine, and it's confusing for all of us. So let me make it simple for students to understand, and many of you would know this very well, that vaccines are of different kinds, live attenuated, inactivated, subunit vaccines, toxoids, conjugate vaccines, DNA vaccines already out there, influenza and herpes virus infection and, and hepatitis virus in fact, uh, there is a DNA vaccine for it. And then of course, uh, now people are talking about RNA vaccine. COVID-19 vaccines are available in all shapes and sizes. You have the DNA vaccine, you have the RNA vaccine, you also have the inactivated uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And there are examples of all of these vaccines available. Uh, but if you look at it, traditionally, large number of vaccines have been in the first two categories or first three categories. 
inactivated or live attenuated or submitted. I will not have time to go deep into the scientific aspects of it. I would urge students to read it uh, if they are acute. The point that I want to make is that COVID-19 vaccine, what is available to us? I'm going to come to that in a minute. Uh, now globally, the vaccines are becoming available since January. Actually, uh, there are already some people got vaccinated in October and November, even in India, I must tell you. But of course, it became publicly available in January. Large number of vaccines have come out. I told you about smallpox in 1700, 1800, sorry, babies, and then whatnot. Now, over the years, we have large number of vaccines. And the reason I'm showing you this timeline of vaccine development, which continues in the next slide, is that majority of these vaccines have been uh, the conventional, traditional types of either heat inactivated, live attenuated kinds of vaccines. Very few have been of the kind that are becoming popular in COVID-19. DNA vaccines and RNA vaccines. So, in other words, we know relatively less about this new generation DNA and RNA vaccines. And and but not to say that they are not safe, but I think this is a relatively new concept. And if I'm not wrong, RNA among RNA vaccines, COVID-19 is one of the first, and uh, which is interesting. And going to be I think that's the vaccine that's being given world over quite efficiently. Um, a spread of what's available uh, for COVID-19 vaccine just for the students. Again, it's a very easy uh, information that's available. The main, most important points that I want to tell you is that various companies all over the world have developed, be it RNA vaccine, DNA vaccine, or the attenuated form of uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. The point that I want to emphasize here, and very proudly enough, that India, of course, boasts of having its own vaccine, a company called Bharat Biotech developed a vaccine indigenously, completely indigenously uh, of, you know, of inactivated virus. And that's actually uh, appearing highly, highly. The clinical trials show that it is very effective. But in addition, of course, uh, uh, there are other vaccines being manufactured in India, which may not be, may not, they were not designed in India, but they're manufactured in India. Some of you may have heard that India is the pharmacy of the world. The vaccine manufacturing capacity in India is one of the largest. And India is manufacturing some of the largest doses of COVID-19 vaccine. As a result, we are able to, in fact, export to many countries. We have already exported to neighboring countries that include Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, but we continue to export it to other countries. Uh, uh, and that's something that has made India very proud because of the large manufacturing capacity that India had. But importantly enough, very interesting to think about that we, uh, Bharat Biotech developed its own indigenous vaccine completely conceptualized in India and developed in India and government of India backed it up very well. In fact, a few, years, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, the Prime Minister himself uh, got a uh, dose of uh, the vaccine developed by Bharat Biotech and uh, he's uh, supposedly doing well and this vaccine is very easy, commonly available. But what I want to show you here is that vaccines um, the challenge in COVID-19 vaccine really was less of conceptual, but more of implementation of manufacturing. This is the first time ever in the history of mankind that you would need a vaccine that will probably will have to be given to every human being on the planet in the years to come. How can, so up until now, there has never been a situation where you wouldn't require a vaccine in such large amounts. That really was the challenge. How can we ever cope with the demand of vaccine at such large uh, uh, amounts? And, and of course, uh, uh, more and more vaccines being available. Of course, it all started with you know provide, giving vaccine first to the uh, frontline workers and so on, and then to uh, the senior citizens. And now gradually it's becoming available to the others. And there's a lot of information. But when you think about vaccine, I want to flash a couple of slides to intrigue the students that you really have to think about precisely what is there in the vaccine. When you talk about DNA vaccine, what is the piece of DNA out there? When you talk about RNA vaccine, as I'm showing you in this slide from Pfizer, what is the specific RNA sequence out there, is there in the vaccine? Please do think about the specifics. That's where the science and exciting uh, information is. DNA vaccine, again, uh, COVID shield and all of those are actually DNA vaccines and you know in a proteal liposomal particle for its effective delivery to humans. But this is what I was telling you that India, it's, is, is one of the largest producers of vaccines 
Uh, I already gave you example of some of the companies that are producing vaccines and there are more that are coming into picture and that's going to be a good news, not just for us, but for the world over. Very quickly, I'm going to wrap up and say that well, all well and good that vaccine is available, but how did we create a vaccine in one year? January 2019, we had began to have this problem. January 2020, uh, vaccine 2021, uh, vaccine is available now to us in one about one year. Uh, January 2020 is when the problem began. 2021 January is when vaccine is now available. Today. Uh, to available to a large number of people. What I want to share is that typically, traditionally, vaccines take large number of years to go through research, preclinical development, and clinical development. It almost takes five to ten years, and then, of course, the implementation, execution, transfer process to manufacturing, and then delivery all takes another few years. This is how the trajectory is. But in case of COVID-19, because of the emergency, people have actually fast-forwarded many of the regulatory steps. Uh, and a lot of government support has been available as a result unachievable uh, what was which was thought unachievable has been achieved that vaccines are now available multiple vaccines are available new vaccines are coming out and it's all good news i'm going to end very quickly and say that we will continue to need new vaccines of course covid 19 vaccine is available but of course there are many other vaccines uh beat uh, zika ebola some are ready and others are uh, in the pipeline and the experience with COVID-19 has helped us uh, and will help us. Uh, Bharat Biotech, India's first COVID-19 vaccine, indigenously manufactured and conceived, that is very important. And then uh, the cocktail of vaccines from various other countries, which and some of them being manufactured in India uh, on large scale. I emphasize that again. And with that, I want to end by this simple comment uh, that pandemic has taught us a lot of things. It's an exciting opportunity for students to think about science as a as a as a um, as a way forward, as a uh, to study further science and uh, uh, and and maybe make a career out of it and make a difference in the society. And of course, uh, COVID nineteen is a situation where scientists, politicians, uh, regulatory bodies have worked together to um, uh, to overcome this challenge. And I think overcoming the challenge is a is possibly uh, something that is too early to say, but we have uh, made a small difference. And um, to leave some time for students to interact, I will uh, conclude at this point and would like to thank you for your patient here. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Professor, for that presentation. Now we have a few questions for you. Uh, the first question is from Cindy Yao from uh, Fuzhou Lakeside International School, China. And uh, she is asking you, why is it that bats react differently to the coronavirus than humans do? Well, you know, that those are the species differences. Um, many infections, many organisms um, can Many animals can harbor organisms without uh, damage to themselves. But when the same organisms enter another species, it can cause infection. And there are multiple various reasons for it. Um, uh, bats do not succumb to coronavirus infections as humans do. Um, the difference is in the way the infection is caused and the way the disease, the infection transmits. So as a result, you know, until about a few years ago, virus which was residing in bats had not encountered humans. But when it did, through uh, because of the kinds of interactions that uh, have taken place between animals and humans, in this case, bats and humans, it did find entry into the human system. And then suddenly it actually began to, there were mutations that took place and it adapted to the system and became a virulent form. So yes, it's all about the genes of coronavirus. That's where the mysteries lie. But broadly speaking, it's commonplace knowledge that organisms that, are, that some animals are completely comfortable harboring can be extremely harmful for other animals. That's because of the species boundary in terms of infection and in terms of the invasiveness that the viruses and bacteria can exhibit in different biological systems. If I have to explain this in a deeper, it will be a long time. 
but I hope I have given you some small information about the question. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor. Earlier, you showed us some pictures of uh, some of the meetings that took place between experts uh, on uh, COVID-19. So we have a question from Manya Singh for you, and she's asking if there is a set of communication systems between medical experts globally. It's a very good question, uh, Manya. That's a very pertinent question. Um, and this has been the biggest challenge. Uh, to me, it continues to be a challenge. You know, so I'm going to answer this question in a bit you know, bigger way. I'll take a half a minute to answer this question, maybe 15, 20 seconds. But the point is that even today, actually there is not enough communication internationally as far as COVID-19 is concerned. You know that there is great uh, you know, differences in the way different populations have reacted to COVID-19. While in US, it continues to be, still continues to be on the rise, the much more severe uh, infection COVID-19 has caused in uh, that population, but in India, that, and we do not have a clear answer. And so really what you're pointing is a very important, that there has to be a lot of collaboration among the different countries, scientists. We, we haven't seen that a whole lot in the time in the last year or so. And that's really why this question is still open. It's an unanswered question that why have different populations reacted differently to COVID-19? So your point is absolutely valid. There has to have to be better platforms. And that's something hopefully we will, people have been so busy just fighting this infection within their own countries that they haven't had enough opportunity to think about collaborations. But yes, some collaborations are beginning to happen supported by governments. Discussions are happening among scientists and platforms are being created as we speak, but yes, not at the pace that was necessary. We can do better. Okay. Um, yeah, Professor Tatu, we have to say thank you so much for giving us your time of day and uh, for helping us understand that there's in fact uh, 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 production of vaccines at a mass scale going on in India and that people do not have to be fearful um, and that their time to get the vaccines are going to come soon and that we are in fact capable of exporting vaccines to other countries. Thank you so much for giving us that understanding. Uh, thank you once again for, uh, for, for your presentation and all the knowledge that you shared with us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It was a pleasure. Thank you.